Chairman, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's a great pleasure to be with you and a great privilege to follow my four distinguished diplomatic service colleagues, Sir Richard, Sir Graham Boyce, Sir William Patey, Sir Tony Brenton and Sir Richard Dalton in delivering this fifth Lord Denman Memorial Lecture. I am most grateful for the Society's invitation. I'm afraid I cannot claim to be an Asian expert, except to the degree that the Middle East is West Asia. And I see a number of former colleagues and friends here this evening from the Arab world, so clearly the RSAA does allow the camel call within their walls. Uh, but I can say that I am shadowing Charles Denman's own West Asian bias, given his lasting affection for and deep expertise in the Arab world. Is this Russia's moment in the Middle East? I can't pretend either to be knowledgeable about Russia, especially on the inside. I've sparred with Russian representatives in many forums across the decades, but have not come close to unwrapping Churchill's enigma. On the other hand, I've learned a bit about the global scene and the interactions of peoples and governments. And my answer to the question you have set me, is this Russia's moment in the Middle East, which is no, will be addressed through a big picture lens. I suppose the Middle East fits awkwardly into an Asian framework, partly because it has an African dimension, partly because the Arab race and its history is self-contained, but also because the fertile crescent, with its evolving civilizations, histories, and religions writes its own distinct chapter in the human story, separate from those of China or Japan or India. The region also has a disturbing habit of generating movements and conflicts that capture global attention and draw in outside powers because of its history, its geography, and its natural resources. Russia has had its moments in the Middle East before, but they have not turned out that well. Egypt under Kamal Abdel Nasser was a particular target of the Soviet Union in the context of the Cold War. And if the creation of the United Arab Republic as a merger of Egypt, Syria, and Iraq, the three countries of the Caliphate proper, had succeeded in the 1960s, Moscow might have had more to play with. But Arab unity has been an elusive concept in modern history, and Israel's stunning victory in the Six-Day War 50 years ago this week had much wider consequences than just prolonged catastrophe for Palestine. That left Ba'athism in Syria and Iraq as a possible partner for communism, not least because Ba'athism kept the West at bay in those two countries. Elsewhere, America's relationship with Egypt after the 1979 accommodation with Israel and the Western leading tendencies of the Gulf states provided infertile ground for Russian meddling. Oil and its related economic imperatives, including arms sales, gave the West a distinct advantage. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 saw the United States as the overwhelming master in the Middle East amongst outside powers. Russia was forced to come to terms with the single superpower era and focus on its immediate neighbourhood. It retained its links with Syria, Iraq, and with Iran, but these were the troubled nations of West Asia, politically and economically. 
Now, this selective summary of the historical narrative is intended to set up my primary point about the contemporary story of Russia's return to being a broader Middle East player. It was Iraq that formed the turning point. Superpowers are not immune from own goals. William Petty in 2014 and Tony Brenton in 2015 referred you to the Soviet disaster in Afghanistan. That cancelled out any Asian advantage Moscow might have gained from the American catastrophe in Vietnam. The hubris implicit in the Soviet assumption that they could defy the lessons of history in Afghanistan and impose their will there forms part of the corpus of lessons to be learnt about intervention in the modern era. Washington got it wrong too, and not only in Afghanistan, where the focus on Osama bin Laden distracted them from the more important objective of settling Afghanistan as a stable state unlikely to breed terrorists. Having clearly won the Cold War, the United States developed a mindset of unilateral exceptionalism under the George W. Bush administration that led them to believe that they could refashion Iraq in their own interest. The first and greatest mistake that Bush made in Iraq was to set the wrong mission for the post-invasion period. The legitimacy of the invasion itself can be disputed. It certainly failed to get specific clearance in the Security Council. But Bush asked General Tommy Franks, Commander CENTCOM, to rid Iraq of Saddam Hussein and turn the government over to different Iraqis. He should have asked him to create a secure and stable Iraq without Saddam Hussein in it. The much more complicated business of establishing a viable state after a change of government was never properly analysed or prepared for. The unravelling of the situation in Iraq stemmed from that crucial point. The resources needed were never committed. Donald Rumsfeld was determined to accomplish what he saw as his goal with minimal cost, as in Afghanistan. And the political leadership and structure to form the next administration were never properly identified. I shall spare you a, a recapitulation of my recent book on Iraq and come to the point about Russia's observations of the American failure in Iraq. They're quite complex and require some explanation. The loss of superpower status was a bitter blow to the Russian state. As a layman in Russian history, I cannot tell you to what extent this was, and indeed is, felt by the Russian people, or even by the leadership in the Yeltsin era. Yeltsin was too busy picking up the pieces in the 1990s and the people have always had to pay first attention to self-sufficiency and daily subsistence. But resentment over loss of status has been a marked feature of the Putin era. In my five years as UK permanent representative in New York, I constantly witnessed the frustration and anger of the Russians over the attempts of the United States to develop a unilateral path to realising their interests. At the UN, this became visible over Yugoslavia during the 1990s, over the bombing of Iraq in December 1998, over Kosovo in 1999, over Iraq in 2002-03, and over Libya in 2011. Even more serious in Moscow's eyes was the steady encroachment eastwards of NATO from the early 
90s onwards, and the moves made by Washington to establish missile defense systems in Europe. Throughout this period, the Russians regarded the Americans as incapable of keeping their word and disrespectful of Russia's legitimate interests. They became determined to exact a price for that. The conclusions I drew from my experience of this in the Security Council for five years uh, facing Sergei Lavrov uh, across the Security Council table have left me with a firm impression of the visceral dislike felt by leading Russians for American policymakers and for the American system, sometimes amounting to contempt for the strategic capability of American planners and practitioners. In spite of the relationship between Moscow and Baghdad in the Saddam era, there was no especial Russian wish to protect Saddam from the consequences of the invasion of Kuwait and his defiance of UN resolutions. But the Russians were dead set on preventing the United States from creating a unilateral route to the violent overthrow of Saddam Hussein and to the domination of the state that succeeded Saddam. Wisely, perhaps even cunningly, Moscow saw that direct confrontation with Washington or with US forces on the ground might escalate into something really dangerous. They went down the different tack of allowing the Americans to take responsibility for a policy which was much more likely to fail than to succeed and to deny the Americans and the British any international legitimacy for their chosen path. This policy decision bore fruit in the trouble the Americans and British experienced in trying to win Security Council approval for their approach, in the travails of the US-UK occupation of Iraq, and in the advantages which Iran, increasingly of close interest to Moscow as a regional partner, drew from the arrival of a Shia majority government in Baghdad and from the opportunities for meddling in their neighbors' affairs. It was an important follow-up to the US experience in both Afghanistan and Iraq, and an important harvest for Russian policy to reap, that in 2008 the American electorate chose a president who promised to bring American forces back home from unprofitable overseas adventures. Barack Obama's distaste for these two enormous commitments, and more widely for the George W. Bush administration's unilateral tendencies, led to assumptions everywhere that the United States was withdrawing from the Middle East, perhaps in favor of a pivot to Asia, or perhaps in a deeper reaction to the loss of US credibility and legitimacy on the international scene. The single superpower moment appeared at that point to be coming to an end. And I think later events and trends have confirmed that impression. So let's turn to Syria and to the Russian decision to go in deep there. What lessons might they have learned from their experience in Afghanistan in the 1980s and from observing and profiting from the struggles from the Americans and British in Iraq? Why have they chosen to focus on Syria now? We should look at some of the possible motivations for Moscow's dramatic intervention in Syria in September 2015. One of them, of course, was to try to preserve the regime of Bashar al-Assad, inherited from his father, Hafid, which formed the basis for Russians' position in Syria, including, of course, the naval facility in Tartus and the airbase near Latakia. It would have been a serious blow to Russia to lose their number one relationship in the region 
to a rebellion as they saw it fostered by Western powers. Another motivation was a genuine wish, yes, genuine in my view, in the light of the Islamic threat to Russia's southern flank, to counter the likelihood that ISIL and Al-Qaeda would come to dominate the Syrian opposition and establish a firm base in Syria for lethal mischief elsewhere. A third motivation was to show up the Obama administration's hesitancy in the region and reassert Russia's, Russia's claim to be an indispensable player in the region and beyond. This reason is significant against the background of Russia's resentment over loss of status and the Putin team's low opinion of American tactical and strategic capability. Fourthly, I believe Moscow intended to open up a second front of aggressive initiative after its intervention in Ukraine and its annexation of Crimea to divert attention from the difficulties of implementing the Minsk Agreement. They were, in effect, playing the classic tactic of creating an extended buffer zone of awkwardness to protect the core interest of Ukraine. The incident of Assad, the Assad regime's chemical weapons attack in mid-2013 on their own people, when the Russians were instrumental in persuading the Syrians to scale back their CW holding, enlarged Moscow's ambition in Syria. At the cost of narrowing the offensive capability of Damascus, when the Russians anyway had no interest in seeing the Syrians develop a unconventional weapons capability. They left Assad free to barrel bomb his population as he wished, exciting plenty of noise from civil society, but no effective response from Washington, even though Obama's red line had been crossed. Yet again, the buffer zone tactic had proved useful, and the Russian view of American policy making confirmed. Even the British Parliament featured in the West's weak response by denying the government a victory in the House of Commons over the use of force in Syria. The shadow of Iraq, without a doubt, lay over President Obama's hesitancy and over the British reluctance to get involved. As the tragedy in Syria has continued to unfold, Western policy has stumbled over other issues. The apparent determination to see the end of Assad's presidency has faltered now that the Russians have propped him up, and our indecisiveness over priorities, as between the Assad regime and the elimination of ISIL, has allowed the Russians to impose their own choice on Western <coughs> capitals. The arrival of President Trump has reinforced pragmatism over principle, and the removal of ISIL from Iraqi and Syrian soil with the partial but effective participation of Western forces has become the first objective. It is an extraordinary development, at least to someone like me, who has spent his whole career calculating how to fit in behind the Americans on almost every issue to watch the Russians, Iranians, and Turks take the lead, with the UN following meekly behind in the recent Syrian negotiations in Astana, without anything but a mild observer's role for Washington and other Western capitals. We should come back to the lessons that ought to have been learnt from the Afghanistan and Iraq experiences. Is there a cost the Russians are beginning to incur in Syria? Will they construct a successful exit strategy? Earlier last year, Moscow appeared to withdraw a number of troops from Syria as things began to go their way, but they quickly returned when Damascus showed signs of wobbling again. The moral downside of supporting a murderous regime like Assad's and of being party to the indiscriminate killing of civilians across Syria 
may be affecting the image of Russia internationally. But this washes off Moscow's back when the strategic gains seem to be coming in. And when American drone strikes in Afghanistan and elsewhere wipe out a wedding party here and a family gathering there. And when American and British arms sales to Saudi Arabia found their way to the Yemen theater. On the contrary, the Russians appear sufficiently impressed with their own advances in Syria, given the set of motivations that I described earlier, to be turning to Libya next. Libya was one of the issues which aggravated Russian anger with the West when in 2011 the British and French, led from behind by Washington, overinterpreted a UN Security Council resolution as providing a basis for bombing the Gaddafi regime. That too led to a Western failure, as the removal of the distasteful government precipitated not the arrival of a better one, but violent chaos across the country and the exploitation of the vacuum by Islamist groups. Now we are witnessing a Russian attempt to draw close to the renegade but powerful faction of General Khalifa Haftar in East Libya, which opposes the government of national accord backed by the UN and most Western governments. In the light of the UN's failure to broker a resolution of the internal dispute in Libya, Moscow is even opening up its own channels to the GNA in order to try their own mediation. The inference that Moscow can succeed in the Middle East, where the West has abjectly failed, is an obvious one. So, why am I saying that this is not going to be Russia's moment in the Middle East? I'm not about to claim that the Americans are on their way back. President Trump's recent trip to Saudi Arabia and Israel, his first overseas journey since taking office, is no doubt intended to be an indication of a renewed American interest in the region in contrast to his predecessor's policy inclinations. A shared American and Russian interest in, in eliminating terrorist groups across the region might create a different dynamic from the trends of recent years, a one in which an almost equal Russian role would have to be acknowledged. But the shadows of Iraq and of Palestine lie quite darkly over US approaches to the region uh, as compared with re previous decades, and Arab countries are wary of becoming part of a scheme to make America great again. My answer is rather that this is not the time for any outsider's moment in the Middle East. The geopolitical trend is strongly towards the localization of legitimacy in international affairs. Outsiders no longer have a right, if indeed they ever did, to dictate to nations with their own protected sovereignty what their future should be. The first achievement of the United Nations, and the one most prized by the majority of member states, is to safeguard independent countries from interference by others. Only second to that comes the interest of most nations in the usefulness of the UN as a place to stimulate collective solutions to collective problems. That is certainly the Russian view. But there's a broader reason why Russia is most unlikely to exert a wide or a longer term appeal to countries of the Middle East, even though it may be a useful partner in the short term or on specific issues. Russia in my experience, is not a constructive power. It contributes little to collective international problem solving. Its economy is not strong enough to provide financial investment or budgetary support, and its companies find it hard to match the technological or innovative skills of Western businesses. It is an opportunist player and a sharp 
tactical operator, but its strategic strength is suspect. Its relationship building is pragmatic and self-interested. Arab governments and leaderships can relate to these characteristics when the circumstances <coughs> require it, but it takes more than that to construct a relationship of trust. I don't think that this worries Moscow to any great degree. The Russians haven't actually shown any lasting historical attachment to the region or to the Arabs as a race. They see the, they see the Americans managing their regional business in somewhat similar ways beyond the specific case of Israel. Even on the question of Palestine, where the West with the US in the lead has notably failed to deliver justice to both sides in this mother of all territorial disputes, the Russians have been unwilling or unable to capitalize. The British and the French have over time made a deeper impression in terms of their historical and cultural relationships in the region, but now lack the power and the will to exploit that to their own advantage. As for the Arab viewpoint, their outside relationships carry a load of memories and prejudices. Their international status too has taken a knock in the modern era. Indeed, it has been a long downhill journey ever since the glorious early days of Mohammedan conquest and Arab medieval scientific and literary capability. The Ottoman Empire subjugated them, and the colonial age exploited them. But the Americans, British, and French are familiar company in their 19th, 20th, and 21st century journey, and on the whole, they know where they are with us. But the Middle East, of course, is not just composed of Arab states. The Iranians, Turks, and more recently Israelis are not only present in the region, they are primary players, endowed with an independent spirit, a national pride, and operational capacities which compare very well with the underperforming Arab average. Russia appears to have recognized this and to have formed relationships with the Iranians and the Turks in particular that have served their interests. Even with the Israelis, wary as the Russians are of the close ties to America, there is some element of mutual respect and a capacity to do business on practical terms. Moscow has observed that the attempts of Western countries to sow the seeds of democracy in the region, including through the invasion of Iraq in 2003, have borne little fruit. It does not surprise me that Presidents Putin and Erdogan have discovered the possibility of a mutually beneficial relationship in spite of their different national backgrounds and interests. We have reached the point in the evolution of geopolitical affairs where the benefits of a democratic system are being challenged. Government is such a hard task in a complicated, interactive, open, and rapidly changing world. And the threats to national and cultural identities from globalization are so disturbing to communities and peoples that the appeal of strong leadership is beginning to outweigh worries about individual liberties or even corruption. Democracy has shown its usefulness in removing bad governments, but its record in replacing them with better ones is starting to look patchy. Authoritarian leaders have grasped this, and may have learned from the instances of Iraq and the Arab Spring that repression works if it is made effective. As the institutional framework for international affairs established by the West from 1945 onwards begins to lose its shine, dictators have begun to talk to and work with each other across divides 
in ways which will present us with some awkward consequences if the trend continues. In the end, however, even if Russia has made some tactical gains in the last few years, I do not see them changing the nature of the Middle East or establishing a long-term advantage there. Over time, the capacities of the countries of the region to look after themselves and make their own choices will, in fact, improve. The Russian association with the Assad regime will reduce Moscow's political appeal to most other Arab capitals, and the weaknesses of the Russian economy will turn Middle Eastern business and financial interests in other directions. But we would not be having this debate if the astuteness of Putin's manoeuvring had been of a lower order, and if the results of the Iraq adventure had not turned out so thin. This perhaps is my central point. The Russians are opportunists not constructors of a new order. It is the West that has let them in. Thank you very much.